in this lecture, we will look at medium access control and how we can support multiple wireless devices to access the medium and communicate on the shared spectrum. So let's first st start the discussion by talking about the OSI model of communication layers. So the OSI model standardizes the uh, communication, uh, the telecommunication and computing systems by dividing the communication process into seven layers and each of them have a very specific function. So let's just briefly look at some of these layers. So the first layer is the physical, which handles a physical connection, the raw data transmission, and it basically deals with electrical signals, voltages and connection connectors. The next layer, which is very relevant to medium access control is data link layer and it ensures reliable data transfer, error uh, detection and correction, and it organizes data into frames and manages the physical addressing at the devices. The next layer is network, which manages the routing of packets between network, logical addressing, and it in some respect determines the optimal data transfer path. The next layers are transport and the uh, uh, application layer. Sometimes we also talk about, for example, layers such as uh, session and presentation layers, but uh, uh, in, in this uh, course, we are not going to talk about these layers in much uh, detail. So in OSI model, data undergoes encapsulation as it moves uh, through each layer. And, uh, and with, as the data moves through each layer, a uh, header is uh, uh, added uh, uh, for proper handling. So, Application layer, the data is generated by the application and it is passed to the lower layer. In the transport layer, data is segmented and wrapped with a header containing source and destination port, create, uh, and it's is then used to create a segment or datagram. In the network layer, the segment is encapsulated with a header containing source and destination IP address, and it forms a packet. And in the data link layer, the packet gets another header with a link layer address and possibly trailer for error detection and thus creating a frame. And finally, at the physical layer, the frame is converted into signals for transmission. And header contributes to overhead, but are vital for communication uh, 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 as the packet moves from one source to the destination. So for example, here we have an example of an internet packet and uh, uh, it has a data and it has a packet header and then it's uh, encapsulated with a frame header and then we have an ethernet uh, frame. So we can also look at this process in detail uh, with this example. So we have two hosts, host A and host B, which are trying to connect through an ethernet and they send a they want to send a data which is then encapsulated with the header and then it's uh, uh, it is encapsulated with the header from the ethernet frame it's transmitted and at the receiving site, a reverse operation is performed to recover back the data and the header is removed at each stage as the packet passes through different uh, layers of the communication stack. So this lecture focuses on the medium access control, which is a vital function of the data link layer in the OSI model. And the data link layer performs several tasks. First is framing. What does it mean? It organizes the raw data into structured frames, adding headers and trailers to ensure effective communication. Next is the logical link control and it manages data transfer between transmitter and receiver and it ensures that the orderly frame exchange happens between the transmitter and receiver and it also uh, takes care of maintaining a reliable connection between two, these two devices. Next, we have error de correct detection and correction and it utilizes techniques such as checksums and CRC to identify and address corrupted frames uh, for reliable data transmission. And finally, we have medium access control, uh, which regulates access to the shared media uh, communication medium and prevents collision and also manages resource allocation among different devices. So the data link layer works very closely with the physical layer to jointly manage function like medium access control and signal transmissions. So let's talk about framing. So framing involves organization of raw data into structured packets, which are known as frames. And a typical frame consists of a preamble. And what is preamble useful for? It synchronizes the transmitter and receiver for accurate data transmission. Next, the frame consists of header fields, which contain crucial information like the source and the destination address, the frame type, length, and other metadata that, that could be used for routing purposes. Next, we have the data payload, which carries the actual data that is being transmitted. 
And finally, we have trailing fields, which include things like error detection mechanisms, such as CRC to identify uh, any errors that might have been introduced while the packet has been transmitted. And the frame design uh, takes into account factors like multi-hop routing, data rate support, and thus th there is a careful consideration that uh, has to be made in terms of deciding the various fields that become part of the frame. So the data link layer performs several important functions, including error control. And this function involves detecting an, uh, a corruption bit, which is especially important in low power wireless communication, where transmissions may introduce significant errors. And some of the tasks involved in error control includes uh, detecting errors and discarding corrupted packets and performing CRC or uh, 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 CRC checks to detect single bit or burst of errors that might be present. And once the errors are detected, the next task include conducting uh, uh, retransmission or uh, correcting the errors uh, or uh, sort of like employing mechanisms to recover corrupted bits. So why are error con control mechanisms so important for wireless com communication? In contrast to wired networks, while uh, wireless networks can be highly variable and error prone. And they're shared among many devices that are operating together. For example, in Wi-Fi networks, the throughput may change based on the device location and wall that the signal passes through. Furthermore, signals from other wireless devices can also interfere with the signal. Additionally, some of the bits that are wirelessly transmitted may flip or may never be heard at all. So all of these actually contribute uh, to the wireless transmissions being error prone. And many things can happen to wireless transmission as it propagates from transmitter to receiver. This is why error control mechanisms are so important in low power wireless communication links where transmission may introduce these significant errors. So one important difference between wired and wireless communication is that the wireless communication uh, occurs in a shared medium. In wired communication, signals are usually confined to the conductor, which can be made of materials such as copper or fiber. And this directs energy to the uh, this uh, copper or fiber uh, uh, material directs energy from the source to the des destination device and protects the signal from the interference. On the other hand, in wireless communication, since it is inherently broadcast in nature on a shared medium, the energy is distributed in the space. And different devices and signals compete in the same frequency band. So how can we increase the capacity of wireless transmission? In wired network, this may mean adding multiple wires or lines between transmitting and receiving device to send data in parallel. However, in wireless network, it is not uh, that straightforward as adding more links would increase interference that occurs because it's a shared medium. Instead, what we need to do is we need to use diversity in space, frequency, and other factors to allow concurrent transmission so that we can send more data over this shared medium. So another key difference between wired and wireless communication is its ability to support multiple access. This means that the mediating access to the uh, this means mediating access to the medium and ensuring who gets uh, 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 the right to transmit at any particular instance of time. This is important because wireless communication uh, two uh, transmissions may occur at the same time, and because it's a shared me me uh, medium, it may cause uh, these transmissions to interfere with each other and cause a loss of packet, which can be extremely energy consuming because it would require the transmitter to send the packet again. So, in an uh, one of the analogy to sort of like think about wireless communication is uh, to think about in a room who gets to speak. Uh, uh, so if let's say we have two people that talk simultaneously, there will be a collision that occurs and both messages may be lost. So maybe we might require solutions like we want to make eye contact, wait for silence, take turns, or speak in different tones. And, or, and in wireless communication, we have very similar methods that are used to allow different devices to communicate at the same time. So the central issue addressed in this lecture is coordinating access for multiple radio transmitters that are sharing a common channel or a, co a common medium. And this ensures an efficient and reliable communication without interference. So we want to actually avoid this scenario where there are two transmissions that are happening together and they interfere with each other. So to implement multiple access scheme, mechanisms can be employed to avoid a reduced collision. 
or uh, they we can employ mechanisms that detect collision or they can determine when to retransmit and many maclay protocol use one or more of these strategies to achieve efficient multiple access so we divide these mac protocols in different categories and we would discuss them in greater detail in the rest of the lectures and these can be divided into random access protocol controlled access protocol and channelization protocol and and these sort of like differ by some of them reduce collision or some of them avoid collision. So with this, we can come to an end of this part of the lecture.